You often hear platitudes associated with immigration in this country. We've always been a nation of immigrants, and people come here because they love us. You hear the argument that we need more people here from other countries, no matter who they are, where they are, what they are, what their backgrounds are, whether they have any experience or skills or literacy, because it helps our economy and so forth, despite the fact we have a massive welfare state, despite the fact we rarely assimilate anymore. We just get proclamations from radio hosts and TV commentators and politicians and ethnic front groups, if you will, on generalizations about who's coming here and why they're coming here. And then we're told the politics of it is moving in one direction and one direction only. We better get on that juggernaut. Well, I don't think we should be rushed into things. I don't think we should be pushed into things. I don't think we should be beaten down and surrendered to this. I have a question for all those who would reward lawlessness. I have a question for the President of the United States who keeps defying the rule of law and the Constitution. If you don't have to follow the Constitution and the rule of law, why do we? That is, if you won't follow the highest law in the land, why should we follow what you say? Why should we follow what your bureaucracy says? Why should we follow what a judge says? If you're going to use executive orders to evade judicial opinions. If it's good enough for Obama, isn't it good enough for us? And this is the poison Obama has unleashed in this society, and he's not the only one. I'm going to try and give a short history lesson of immigration in this country. Not a popularized lesson, not a cultural lesson, but a real lesson. If there's one area of the law that should be universally understood as being largely outside of the purview of the Supreme Court, it's immigration. Well, Mark, why do you say that? You'll see in a minute. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says Congress shall have the power, quote, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization, unquote. Not the President, Congress. And yet a few years ago in the Arizona case, the Supreme Court conferred on Obama absolute power, absolute power, to decide what parts of immigration laws would and wouldn't be enforced in order to defeat Arizona's claim that it wanted to enforce federal law because Obama wasn't. Notice what I read. It's from Article 1, the article dealing with Congress, Section 8. Congress shall have the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Not the President and not the Supreme Court. But that's not how events have transpired. For the last several decades, you need to know the Supreme Court has effectively trampled on Congress's constitutionally mandated, separate, and exclusive power and has taken upon itself the task of rewriting America's immigration laws. That's how we've gotten to our point today, where Obama conducts himself the way that he does. The Supreme Court is not our savior, ladies and gentlemen. Look at Obamacare, among other things. Now, the court abused its limited authority and has become effectively the architect of the rules governing not only how immigrants enter and remain in America and conferring this unconstitutional power on one man, the president, but whether those immigrants can avail themselves of social benefits that states and even Congress have sought to limit, to limit to U.S. citizens. So thanks to succeeding Supreme Courts, illegal immigrants, not legal immigrants, aliens who've come here breaking our laws, are entitled to public education at the taxpayer's expense. They're entitled to health care at the taxpayer's expense. They're entitled to due process. They're entitled to all kinds of things the Constitution does not confer on foreigners who illegally come into the country. I'm just trying to explain because we need to know. Before American independence, each of the 13 colonies developed its own immigration policies. Now, most of the policies were geared toward encouraging immigration from Europe in particular to help alleviate severe labor shortages throughout the vast expanse of the colonial territories. Land grants and exemptions from taxes were popular enticements to immigrants to settle in the New World. But most of the colonies also had laws in place to discourage certain types of immigrants. I'm not encouraging this, I'm explaining this. Specifically, Roman Catholics. Many of the colonies levied uh, head taxes on ship captains for any Catholic that they brought ashore. Certain colonies offered land grants and tax benefits only to Protestants. So as a result, the majority of the early immigrants came from Protestant England and Germany. After 1776, the new Congress did not 
preempt the state's existing immigration and naturalization policies. The only modification to the status quo came in Article 4 of the Articles of Confederation, the forerunner to the Constitution. And that provided that citizens of each state were given the same privileges, citizens, and immunities as citizens of every other state. But each state retained its own naturalization and immigration laws and standards. This arrangement created a de facto briar patch of policies and practices that would inhibit commerce and limit America's potential role in the world stage. So at the Constitutional Convention in 1787, they sought to address this. Article 1, Section 8 of the new Constitution. Congress has the power, quote, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Now, the first effort to... Con- uh, is this boring, Mr. Producer, or is it, is it background that's much needed, I think? Okay. The first effort to control immigration and naturalization came with the Naturalization Act of 1790, when Congress set the residency requirement for U.S. citizenship at two years. In 1795, the requirement was increased to five years. Then in 1798, we get the Alien and Sedition Acts. They were dramatic attempts by Congress, then confronted by the, uh, uh, controlled by the Federalist Party, John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, to address both a national security threat and a political challenge to the Federalist power. So the first was the imminent threat of war with France, and the second was the trend of new immigrants to align themselves with the Anti-Federalists and Thomas Jefferson's party. So I'm not going to get into the Alien and Sedition Acts. We've talked about them extensively over the years in the past. So Jefferson wins the presidency. His party takes control of both houses in Congress in 1800. The Alien and Sedition Acts were repealed. And Congress also returned the residency requirement for U.S. citizenship to five years. Beyond these actions, no real effort was made by Congress to limit immigration in this country until 1875. You see, ladies and gentlemen, really not until the Civil War and soon after the Civil War, was the federal government all that powerful? There certainly wasn't a welfare state. There wasn't a food stamp program or any other program of that sort. So when people came to this country, they didn't get benefits. When people came to this country, they didn't qualify for benefits. There were no benefits. So they really came here to be part of this American dream. They really came here escaping tyranny of one sort or another. They really came here to make new lives for themselves, to break with the past, to break from their former countries and former cultures. They wanted to be Americans. Not hyphenated Americans, but Americans. And they wanted to assimilate into society. They wanted to earn, uh, learn English. They wanted to take advantage of private property rights and what we call today capitalism or free trade and commerce. And they wanted to experience religious liberty and all forms of liberty. They weren't part of ethnic groups lobbying Washington, D.C. There was no such thing as affirmative action and on and on and on and on. 1875, Congress passes the first Immigration Act that restricted entry of aliens to the United States because after the Civil War, the federal uh, government became much more powerful than it had been before the Civil War. Now, this 1875 Act prohibited immigration by slaves, prostitutes, and Chinese coolies. Later laws imposed temporary or permanent restrictions on entry by Chinese emigrants and other groups. I'm only giving you the history, like it or not, because when you hear the pro-amnesty crowd, the no-borders crowd going on and on, they say, hey, we've always been a country of free immigration. No, we have not. And circumstances have changed. And when circumstances change, the American people and their government responded to them. Sometimes well, sometimes not so well, as I'm explaining here. But congressional legislation has repeatedly, over the last 200 years, added, modified, or removed the residency, gender, race, age requirements to become a U.S. citizen. Look, the Naturalization Act of 1855, for example, opened U.S. citizenship to immigrant women who married a citizen or whose husband became naturalized. We talk about the, moving much forward, the uh, 1986, it was called Immigration Reform and Control Act. Everybody forgets the control part where 2.7 million illegal aliens were given amnesty and the border was supposed to be secured once and for all. And, of course, we know what happened there. 
Then we have the 1996 amnesty bill. Congress enacted the Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. You remember that? 1996. And that gave immigration officers the authority to summarily deport an alien if the officer determines the alien has engaged in fraud or misrepresentation or the alien does not possess valid documents. We don't do that anymore, do we? We don't do that anymore, do we? So the court decided it was going to start stepping in. Unfortunately, while recognizing in some cases Congress's basic authority to write immigration law under Article I, Section 8, majority of the justices on the Supreme Court have on several occasions used two constitutional provisions to insert the court's institutional nose under the immigration tent. The court discovered, invented, that the Equal Protection and Due Process Clauses in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments granted the judiciary all the authority it will ever need to rewrite America's immigration laws. But the court has chosen in successive decisions to extend the premise of equal protection and due process to include access to social benefits as well. So it's not a question of equality under a law, it's a question of social benefits, the welfare state. Graham versus Richardson, 1971, the court said this court now has rejected the concept that constitutional rights turn upon whether a governmental benefit is characterized as a right or as a privilege. That wasn't always the case. In the years leading up to World War I, the court recognized the distinction between citizens and non-citizens in making and managing public policy. We have a 1915 case, Heim versus McCall. The court decided in favor of New York's authority to show preference in hiring citizens for transit authority projects over aliens. That would later change. That would later be rejected by the same Supreme Court. I'm going to give you a little bit more history. Again, why am I doing this? Not only because of the chaos and anarchy that has been let loose on this country, but the lies coming from this president, from the Republican Party, from the media, from hosts, TV and radio who tell you in platitudinal ways, oh, we've always had open immigration. No, we've not always had open immigration. We've had all kinds of different forms of immigration and requirements and rules, some good, some not so good. But God almighty, what's going on on our southern border, that's bad for everybody as far as I'm concerned. Illegal immigration wasn't tolerated for much of the modern history of this country. Legal immigrants were limited by states on the kinds of public, government, subsidized jobs they could hold until the Supreme Court, starting about 40 years ago, rejected that. And more and more legal immigrants are treated as citizens. Not technically, not completely, but more and more. And what we see happening now is illegal aliens more and more are being treated as citizens without the title but the conference of legal rights of equal protection of due process this is new in american history this is new in american history so when you hear one of these politicians saying people should come out of the shadows first of all remember they're in the shadows because of their own doings but that said i don't see many people in the shadows i see them under the sun and the bright light of the day and so do you And so does everybody else. We've reached a point in this country that we've never accepted before in this country. With a massive welfare state, with the conference of benefits and grants and and economic rights, quote-unquote, on individuals, you can't have an open border. And this is not the history of American immigration. It isn't today. It's never been. It's never been, particularly with a welfare state of the sort that we have today. And the framers would respond to this. Every group of politicians, every Congress has responded to the events of the day, except this one. 